Um, so introducing TDD and BDD. So 15 minutes is quite a short period of time to cover both of these, but um, let's get started. I guess first off, could I see a raise of hands? Who has worked or regularly works uh, test-driven? Quite a few. And who has worked in teams that uh, approach uh, behavior uh, dri driven design, BDD? Not so many. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go through, uh, uh, there are four basically subsections. Uh, we'll start off with an introduction to, to TDD. So I'll go through that quite quickly because it sounds like most of you are doing that already. Then I'll spend a little more time on BDD and then deal with the contradictions or potential contradictions between the two uh, before getting, if I have enough time, slightly more philosophic with XDD. So this is your classic um, uh, TDD cycle uh, that popularized in uh, Nat Price and Steve Freeman's book, Growing Object-Oriented Software Guided by Tests. And you start off, and it's generally described as write a failing test, and then you make the test pass, and then you refactor, and you keep going around this loop. So this is the TDD cycle. It's really simple. It's, you know, it's got three little statements. It's got colored arrows that go between them. But you know, within that, uh, that, there's a lot of complexity, or at least a lot of nuance. So this is another way of thinking about it. The three sections are slightly you know, expanded here. So the first one, it, typically you see TDD described as write uh, a failing test. And that's, well, while that's procedurally um, correct, it's also rather confusing, because that's not what you're attempting to do. The, the idea is not to write a failing test. You know. What you're trying to do is imagine what the next step you want to make is to evolve the implementation that you need for your, for, to deliver value. And so it's quite often rewritten as write the next specification. So essentially, your next test is the next specification of how the system, how the software should behave. And because you haven't done that yet, it's going to fail. But you're not there writing a failing test. And then the second step, make it pass, it needs to be stressed that the idea here is to make it pass quickly. This is sometimes called shameless screen. The intention is not to design everything perfectly. It's to get that test passing so that your, your uh, collection of tests go from failing to all passing. And now that all of your tests are passing, it's safe to refactor. So the intention here is not to get the best design, it's to get them all to green quickly. Because now that they're all green, you can look at them and go, how do I want to improve this design? And you can safely improve the design through the refactor phase. And then this, the, the third thing is, is refactor. Actually, that's usually written in blue. I don't know why I've done it in green here. Uh, then again, I don't know why they do it in blue. Um, but but the, the interesting thing, let's go back a bit. The refactor loop here actually is a cycle. So you could draw, draw it in many other ways. But the idea is you don't go in, you refactor, and you're done. You go in, you look and see, what's this change that I would like to make? You make that change. You make sure the tests are still green. And then you look at it again and say, is there another change that I want to do? Or has that refactoring introduced other, another thing that I want to do? So here, this is a, this is a, a multi-process in itself. It's not a single, a single step. So those are, those are the three state phases of TDD. Uh, one thing that I'm going to, I just want to dwell on very briefly, is the word refactor. Um, because I do, I, I talk to a lot of um, a lot of developers in in my in my line of work, uh, and uh, refactor is often misunderstood. So I'm sure you all understand it here, but I'm just going to reiterate it. When you're refact refactoring, you are not changing the behavior of the code, right? So you never refactor to add a new piece of functionality. You might refactor to get the code base into a state where you want to add, you know, that you want it to be in so that you can add a new piece of functionality. But refactoring, by definition, does not al uh, alter the externally observable behavior of the code. So BDD. So TDD, you know, I showed you a nice little diagram. OK, I've waffled on for, about it for three or four minutes. But it's, you know, it's, it has, it's quite um, contained. BDD, um, however, is extremely uncontained. It's sort of weird. Uh, no one's quite sure what it means. Uh, Matt Wynn, who, uh, who works with me in Cucumber Limited and has been working BD for a while, uh, has tried to distill it down. And he's distilled it down into this one sentence. But even so, it's a lot of words on the page. And actually, if you sort of squint a little bit and it goes all blurry, you know, it's just it's a tapestry of letters and colors. There are some, there are some interesting things in here. But essentially, BDD is a three-level um, approach. The first is, please get developers, testers, and people from the business to talk to each other. 
right? That is the beginning of BDD. Uh, uh, and so anyone who thinks we're doing BDD because we use given when then, well, you may be doing BDD, but the words given when then have nothing to do with BDD. BDD stands for Behavior Driven Development. And the real intent is to try and work out what your customer or your business wants from the software before you start working on it. So the first way of doing this is to actually collaborate with those people. So I'm assuming that most people in this room come from either the development or the test community. So we want collaboration. The second thing, once we've got that collaboration, is to somehow record that in a way that is meaningful to everybody that can review it, who might come along and look at it later, who might want to comment on it, uh, who are, are, are processing out of band. And so this is the definition. Typically, that, that gets done using a ubiquitous language. People often use the given, when, then words, but it's not, that's not pertinent. The idea is we've collaborated, and this is shared understanding. This is unearthed unknowns. Uh, this has made sure that there is a, a collaborative goal that we're trying to achieve. And then when, once we've got good at collaborating, it's worth trying to capture that so that not everybody needs to be in the room at the same time, so that that shared learning can be propagated. And then finally, if, we've got a, if, if it's appropriate to our teams or to our project, we drive out the behavior using automation. So we collaborate, we record that collaboration in some form of specification, and then we automate that specification to drive out the implementation. I come from the Cucumber uh, organization, but this doesn't mention Cucumber anywhere. So Cucumber is not part of BDD. Cucumber is something that has been created to help people automate in a specific way. But if I go back to uh, Nat and Steve's book, Growing Object Oriented uh, Software Guided by Tests, they just use JUnit throughout their, uh, their um, book to automate acceptance tests. It depends entirely on your organization how you want to do it. Uh, the, the classic way, using Cucumber and Specflow and any other tool that uses a, a semi-structured syntax called Gherkin to record and define those specifications, you end up with what are called feature files. Now, feature files are just plain text files. They have semi-structured, I mean, there is a syntax. Uh, the keywords are in, are in blue. Uh, the intent is that anyone from your domain should be able to read your feature files and understand exactly what the intent uh, is of the system, how it is supposed to behave. The feature file looks something like this. It has a feature a name at the top saying what feature it is. It's got some uh, text which tells you what, what the behavior, what the acceptance criteria is, and then it has a number of scenarios that show how the system behaves given certain situations. There's a relationship between uh, the currently the, the classic artifacts that you would get from uh, in, in, uh, in an agile way. And actually, I think uh, given the shortness of time, I'm just going to move straight through this. The, the important thing here is that the examples that you might come up with when you're collaborating get recorded as the scenarios. The acceptance criteria, which are the rules, the, the, the way the system should be behaving, are captured in the text at the top. Uh, and the important thing here is that user stories, which a lot of agile teams get very hung up on, um, are just uh, rubbish at the end of the implementation and should be binned. So, moving on to the contradiction. Uh, you, we've talked about BDD and TDD, and people often say, what's the difference between them? People also um, often go on and ask, and say, well, I've also heard about acceptance test-driven development and uh, this specification by example. Well, what are they all? When should I use them? Uh, are they different? And the reality is that there are, um, you can find websites that will tell you when to use which and which environment and what tools, uh, what uh, systems they're designed to support. Um, Liz Keogh, who works with Dan North, who invented the term BDD, was asked this question, uh, what's the difference between all these things? Her answer is, they're called different things. So there is no essential difference between them. What, what holds them together is that they all require a group of people specifying how the software should behave collaboratively before implementing it. That's the important bit, so maybe that's what we should boil BDD definition down to. The idea is we work from the outside, thinking about how we want it to behave. We use examples to really make sure that everybody in the team understands what we've just agreed on, the concrete examples with concrete data. And we write these examples in a ubiquitous language, a language using terms that derive from the business domain that are understood unambiguously by everybody on the team. So there's no contradiction. 
Then we get onto the DD, the question, what is it all about? So the reason it's called test driven or behavior driven or acceptance test driven is that you have to specify this behavior before you do the implementation. So there's no, we, do, we sort of do behavior driven, we sort of do test driven, we write the tests just at the, you know, in the same sprint. You have to write them first. That's what drives them. That's how it becomes a design process. And it's the failing specification, it's the fact that you see it fail, which is driving you to do the implementation. That's what pushes the developer, that's what the developer uses to think about what code to write. And the second D is for design, quite often. I mean, I know it isn't for design, it's for development, but actually we're designing code. When we write automation, we have to think about how is this going to be consumed? How are we going to invoke this method? How are we going to kick off this behavior? By, by writing, in, uh, writing your code in response to your tests you, and listening to what that tells you, you get testability baked in. You get code that is testable. You get uh, APIs that are consumable. You understand what the contexts are. You get a vast number of benefits way beyond test coverage. So it's not about test coverage. Uh, and finally, the refactoring that you get from both BDD and TDD and having that good uh, body of tests which really specifies how your system behaves is that you can now refactor until uh, you, it feels good. And people go, well, it wouldn't it be nice if we knew when we'd refactored enough? But you know, software is not, uh, you know, put the, put the specs in the top, crank the handle, and the right solution comes out. It's a creative activity. Um, and much as I'm sure you all hate it being thought of as creatives, you are creatives. You know, you have to have a feeling about, and this is why you passionately argue about where the curly braces should go. So, uh, BDD, TDD, ATDD, specification by, by example, they're all the same. They work from the outside in. They use examples to specify how the system should behave. Those examples are expressed in a ubiquitous language that the whole team understands, including the non-technical members. Uh, and then once you've automated it, you get verification, which means that you can tell when your documentation is out of date. It means that you can uh, know when a regression has crept in. It means that you can see how much of the system has been implemented by the development team. All of these things are good. The relevant question when deciding whether to implement a test, a specification using uh, JUnit or CPP Lite or whatever they are, as opposed to a, a tool that supports a natural language processing such as um, Cucumber or Specflow or one of, uh, or even um, a CPP version of uh, Cucumber, is who's interested in reading those tests. And basically, you should push your tests as far down the technical pyramid as you possibly can until the people who are interested in discussing them can no longer understand those tests. So if you want some feedback from your business about something, so if it's, a, if it's a piece of behavior that is really important to your product and your business is gonna say, no, it shouldn't work like that, yes, it should work like this, really consider writing those tests in a way that they can read those tests and go, that is what we wanted. So Cucumber, Specflow, tools that use Gherkin allow you to do that directly in the ubiquitous language. However, you still don't need to use them because you can, uh, you can do what John showed you in the previous talk, which is write out long sentences within the technical, um, the technical framework that you're working on, and that will generate that readable documentation that you can share with your business. You can do it in JUnit, you can do it in um, CPP Lite, you can do it in all of these tools. So there is no problem, but what you do need to do is make sure that it's expressed in a way where you can get the feedback from the people who are interested, the people who have a, um, a stake uh, I've got skin in the game. And that's me. Thank you. <laughs>